Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the In the Eleven podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Griffiths, and this is the show where we bring on those from the world of football to show you what it takes to be in the Eleven at the highest possible level. This week's guest, I am so excited to share with all of you. We have a football agent in the Eleven, John Print, joins us with over 15 years of experience as a FIFA registered intermediary and the current managing director of Sprint Management Group. I can't wait to share with you our conversation because it was really fascinating for me and I'm sure it's going to be fascinating for a lot of you out there. We talk about kind of what exactly it is that agents do, how they help support players, who needs an agent, who doesn't need an agent, how players can help themselves in the process, how agents interact with clubs and and just so many really interesting details, especially for those of you out there who are players and are looking for maybe representation or you know, you've had conversations with agents. I don't want to bore you too much with my intro here because this is a great conversation with myself and John. So without further ado, I'll kick it over to that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, stepping into the 11 with us this week is John Print. Managing Director of Sprint Management Group and a licensed FIFA football agent. John, I am so excited to talk to you about everything kind of in the agent world and everything in the world of football that I'm sure you have a lot of access to that many of us um, in different roles or even outside of the game don't quite get to see. So first of all, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to dive into it. Yeah, thank you, Brennan. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Absolutely. If we set the stage a little bit here, kind of, can you talk to me about your history and, and background with the game? Maybe sort of connect the dots into how you eventually became an agent and decided that was the path for you. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I've been involved in, say, high performance sport for about, well, for over 20 years now. Um, became a football agent, a licensed FIFA agent about 15 years ago um, with the old examination. Um Worked for an agency in London. Um, we worked with hundreds of players, too many players, too many players to manage, which was a, an early lesson learned. Yeah. Um, and then I moved to a uh, American agency, a company called Sports Management Worldwide, which I have an awful lot of respect for still. And um, yeah, we did a lot of business in in North America uh, and also education wise as well. And now I run my own agency sprint management group limited um sprint mg and also i train the next generation of football agents for a, a new company called sports b sports business education mm. so that's the, the short version of my story yeah um but it's a great you know it's a great industry to work in it's a fun industry it's very competitive gotta be quite thick-skinned but you've got to have a strategy and you've got to understand the business which is probably the key. So with that competitive sort of landscape, when it comes to being an agent, what was it that drew you towards that specific, you know, role within the game, player representation and and working with athletes in that way? Well, like, like many, you know, I was, I was, had a dream of playing professional football, didn't make it for whatever reason, Uh, probably not good enough, probably down to, you know, attitude, rather than ability, I would probably say. Um, you know, I was too young, didn't mature at the right stages, got injured at the wrong time. And how how I kind of suddenly, I was doing a marketing degree at the time and mm. I was thinking, this isn't really for me. I don't want a career in marketing. And I, I remember I went out on a, on a date with a girl and um it was a second date and it didn't go that great and i was a bit down i was walking past the cinema and i saw this film by tom cruise jerry Maguire. i was <laughs> gonna go into the cinema and i'm gonna watch <laughs> jerry Maguire, and then it kind of blew blew my mind and i was like yeah. wow this is what i wanted to do you know i always knew i wanted to, i didn't want to be a coach I, I didn't want to i didn't know what i wanted to do in the game you know is either going to be a sports director or an agent. But at the time, sports directors weren't really weren't really a thing. Yeah. 
sport. It was all driven by the head coach. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, an agent. That's what I want to do. And that movie, that damn movie, changed my life. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a bit cliche, but, you know, it did have a big impact on me. And then suddenly everything I was doing in terms of, um, you know, marketing, and then I did a sports, um, I did law masters, was all kind of driven to maybe doing that. I wasn't, you yeah. know, I wasn't so single-minded. That's the only thing I wanted to do. And then suddenly things just start falling in place. You know, the more I networked, the more I spoke to people. And then suddenly just an opportunity came and I got my license and I took it. So yeah. um, here we still are probably about 16 years later or how long it is. Um, yeah. Still, still trying to, still trying to do a deal. And I always, I always ask this question, you know, a lot of, I've spoken to a lot of specifically American players on this show, but really players from all over the world. And, Oftentimes what I'll ask them is especially the ones that finish college and want to go into the professional game. I say to them kind of what was even your first step? Because I think for the players that aren't at the top level, especially in this country, it's often kind of a, a bit of a murky path to figure out how to actually go and be a pro. So I guess I, I have a similar question for you. And it sounds like you've answered part of it in terms of networking, but you know, mm -hmm. you have the inspiration of Jerry Maguire, which I'm sure probably there's hundreds <laughs> or thousands of other agents out there that saw that movie and were like, yep, that's me. How do you then go from that inspiration and kind of figuring out what you want to do to actually putting a plan in place, uh, you know, a plan of action to get to deal number one, signed, sealed, delivered? Oh, my goodness. I don't think I even had a plan when I started out. <laughs> now, it's, all, it's purely based on kind of opportunity and um you know i remember I, I kind of someone told me like years ago don't worry about the plan if an opportunity comes your way work that out later mm. which is probably which is some good advice but it's probably not always the best advice but when you're <laughs> starting out you now there is an element of black you know that you've got yeah. to you know but you've got to be able to sell yourself so i remember when i'm uh, I was speaking to this this guy who suddenly knew this player that was looking for an agent. He was at Southampton Football Club, you know, and um, it basically fell on my lap. Wow. So I reacted quickly. And the next day I traveled, I met the player, issued my representation contract, met the family. A couple of days time later, he signed. So that was after I got my license. So I think, you know, part of it, yeah, you need a plan, but sometimes I think people overthink things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking back, I should have done a lot more research into the regulations and understood the business, but I kind of learned on the, learned on the job. I think at the time when there was less agents, it was easier to, to get by. I think now it's a lot more competitive um, and you get found out a lot more quickly if you're doing mm -hmm. things wrong. But, you know, I did know a few agents as well who, who were kind enough to to kind of guide me at the time. And, um, yeah, I kind of got through it, <laughs> got through it. But, you know, that's the thing. You can engineer an opportunity for yourself just by being present, just by having having knowledge. You know, knowledge is knowledge is definitely power in this in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like it's the type of industry in, in the way in which football moves so quickly, you know, the same has to sort of be applicable for you and your career. And it's, and like you said, you have an opportunity. There's not a lot of time to really dwell on it and think of it. It's, you have to no. kind of move quickly and, and sort of make decisions as you go. I'm curious yeah. when, when you go and have those, those first conversations with a player like that, you know, it's really the first time you've done it. I'm sure this has evolved as you've gone through your career how much of it is very specific to the player that you speak to and how much of it is, you know, I want to make sure every single player that I speak to understands these things about the way I work or these values or, or the way in which we're going to partner together. It's a good question because you know, you can tell somebody how you want to work. You can tell them a hundred times, but if a player doesn't want to listen mm -hmm. or doesn't want to work that way, it's extremely, extremely difficult. You know, it's extremely difficult. Um, so I think, you know, part of the skill of being an agent is actually understanding people. It's understanding their situation and it's understanding how kind of interested they are in the process. Mm -hmm. You know, I get some players that are 
intense. That they, they ring me two, three times a day with updates. You know, they're they're on it. You know, they're really yeah. pushing for a career. I've got others that just sit back. They don't don't give a damn. And basically, all they want to do is just have a contract, and that's it. So there's different different types of players there. Um, but I think you know, professionally as an agent, you've got to have your systems in place. You've got to have your processes in place, and you know, you've got to take control of the narrative. You know, you've got to be the one that is the driving force because if you let the player take control, he's probably going to make mistakes because mm-hmm. he doesn't really know the business. You know, he may think he does. But he, he doesn't he doesn't know the business, and nor do the family, nor does the father or the brother or the uncle or whatever. They don't. Yeah. More often than not, they don't understand, and they will make huge mistakes for their for their friend or their their son or their brother or daughter. Yeah. Yeah. You you, you know you've mentioned there that you've seen players kind of handle the process of you know, a career very differently all the, all the time in which you've represented players. And and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of players that are listening to this and, you know, at many at all different stages of their professional career. So when you even just compare the kind of different types just there a moment ago, when it's some players are ringing you two, three times a day saying, Hey, what's going on? Who have you spoken to? What's the latest? And others just sort of take a back seat to it. I mean, what, what can you even really say in terms of the right way in which a player should build a relationship with their agent, the right amount of sort of work that they should be doing to push their career forward? Like what kind of tools or or tips for success would you give to, to young players out there? Well, it's always about, it's a great question because, you know, from my perspective is about managing expectations and that's expectations on you know, the player and expectations on the actual agent. So the player has to understand where he is in the game. Mm-hmm. So what kind of value of contract is he in scheme in the scheme of things? So how much work can an edge agent actually dedicate to finding that player an opportunity? So if the player is, say, only going to earn 20,000 US dollars, okay? The agent is going to earn between 1,000 and 2,000 US dollars, okay? And he may have to share that with somebody else within his agency mm-hmm. or with another agent because that's the, way, that's the way the industry works. So how much of a service can a player expect if all they're playing is 2,000 US dollars, you know? Not that much. And no, I couldn't work. You know, some players, in order to find a team, you need to be lucky because of where they are in the talent pool. You know, they need to be lucky. Doesn't mean they're not good enough, but it just means that an opportunity has got to land which is a perfect fit. Mm-hmm. And you know, they are probably one step of going out of the game. And now that's and they're desperate. And I understand it. And it's hard, but I cannot commit a month's work for two thousand US dollars. Because you know, that's it, it actually what it could take in terms of emails, WhatsApp, um, development profiles, videos, um, you know, getting on the phone. And that's mm-hmm. before you even negotiated the deal, which can take another week, even for small contracts. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. It can be very simple. It can be very kind of drawn out and complicated. So players need to understand that. Okay. Secondly, a player needs to understand that, if they want to if they want to work in the industry, they can't play agents. Okay? They can't say, find me a club and I'll sign your contract. You can try that, mm. but you are seriously reducing your value in the market. You know, you want somebody who's going to offer you the best advice. You know, if you work for a broker agent, which is fine, they get you an opportunity, great. But don't expect to get the best deal. And then don't come crying back six months later that the contract yeah. is correct, you know, and that's, that's reality. So, you know, you need, you know, my advice to players is always, you know, regardless if you sign with, with myself or sprint management group would be sign with an agent, you know, that agent should be willing to give you the time in order to guide you on the right decisions to make sure the, the, the contract is negotiated correctly and negotiated for success but also a willingness to 
work with other people are going to bring opportunities to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, there's too many egos in this industry with agents and players and this and that. And players lose opportunities and agents do as well because of because of their ego, because they want mm. to control the whole thing. But it's all about, you know, opportunities for players. It's about getting the, the right deal for the player and the club and the agent as well. And that's what, what should be in there. It's just have to understand where they sit in the market going back full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious too, because, you know, it sounds it's solid advice in the sense that a young player kind of coming up and trying to break into the professional game isn't going to have the knowledge of how to negotiate a contract or what a contract would even look like, you know, depending too on what league or country they're going to. But I am curious as well, because as you mentioned there, you know, maybe a player going to get their first contract and it's in some lower league in Europe, it's really not an enticing endeavor for an agent to take on because they know what the payday is going to be at the end of it all. Right. So, yeah. I mean, does every player you think that's trying to be a professional need an agent or are there some players where maybe it makes sense to go and try and get your first contract on your own. And now you're sort of a more marketable entity to an agent. You know, I don't love to use the word of kind of entity or asset when we talk about players, but th there is certainly a fact of, of life when it comes to football is that you are an yeah, asset. So how do you market yeah, yourself to an yeah. agent or club or whoever? Yeah, well, I, I always say, I, I even say this to players. I say, look, you know, there's no point in me helping you. I can give you some context to contact, but you're going to have to do it yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, it, and actually it's less attractive if an agent contacts a lower league club about a player they, they're turned off they go oh, prefer the player contacted us because we can't afford your commission wow okay you know, because they don't want to pay the agent because they can't afford it it's not in their budget and you know i completely understand that so you know what i will say to a lot of players is you know especially the ones that, that are say earning let's give a figure like t under twenty thousand a, a year yeah you know, I would say to them, look, give me some ink. Or sometimes I'll say to them, look, just make, let me look over the contract. Just, I'll give you some advice for free. I'll look over it for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, give you some advice, go back and see what you can do with that. And that's not really talking about the money because in those situations, it's usually very much a, a take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. But it is about building that contract for success is what if, you know, what if things go well, what if things go bad? So that's what I always gear things towards. Hmm. Um, it's like, you know, can you get a move or can you get an increase in wages if you play so many games? You know, if a club comes in for you, how easy is it going to be for you to move or not? Mm -hmm. You know, those, those kind of things. Or if things are really terrible and you hate it, can you get out without so many penalty clauses? Yeah. And when you, you know, I'm curious, as you mentioned something there, how much of this is, I guess, who's sort of consistently footing the bill when it comes to an agent's fees? Is it always the club? Is it sometimes coming out of the player's contract? What does, or are all these different depending on a case by case situation? Well, FIFA trying to change the rules. So uh, those kind of rules around service cap fees have been suspended because of kind of legal challenges in Germany and by the English FA, mm -hmm. uh, by the no, not English FA, but by the um, agents in England. So the service cap fees have been t like kind of put on hold. But traditionally, it's a mixture. You know, players don't like paying their agent. Bizarrely, I don't know why, but I think it's because of you know the the kind of you know they've been taxed on their salary and they've got to pay their agent, and then usually there's tax on that as well. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make it tax efficient for them, so they can't put it by as an expense on their tax bill, which is, is frustrating. So it really depends on territory, depends on club. You know, some some leagues will just pay; they understand they have to pay an agent fee. You know, and that can you typically be up to to ten percent, um, up to you know two hundred thousand US dollars. No, anything mm -hmm. over that would be at um, well six percent total, three or six. 
So what FIFA are trying to do, they are trying to get the player to pay half and and the club to pay half. So like permissible dual representation. So permitted dual, rep- dual representation. Okay. But it is, it is a minefield. It is a minefield. It's like really difficult sometimes because, you know, especially when you're dealing with those lower contracts, you know, they the clubs don't want to pay the agent fee because they just feel it's like an added tax. Yeah. You know, to pay an extra 10% on top. And kind of when you speak about this minefield, I know I've had experience where I've had, you know, quote unquote agents reach out to me uh, over the course of my playing career. And I'm curious if you can shed any sort of insight into this as well. You know, I think, and, and, and maybe too, there's, there's sort of different iterations of, of an agent, you know, there's so many people in football sort of that it doesn't always necessarily need to be an agent that connects you with a club, which I think Mm -hmm. a a lot of us players have come to learn that sometimes there's just sort of, there's not even really a word for them. It's just sort of guys that have connections, I guess is the simplest way to put it. And all of a sudden you're connected with somebody at a club. Right. And so, but the reason I ask is because, you know, I've been reached out, I've been approached by agents in the past and it's like, Hey, come on board, pay me X amount as, you know, a a fee to start working with me. And then this, that, and the other will happen, right? Like, what is your opinion? I guess, I know we just sort of broke down the way the the typical agent model is supposed to work, but what is your opinion on quote unquote agents? If they are legitimate agents or not, that sort of operate that business model. What be charging a fee up front. Yeah. Shouldn't happen. Mm. Shouldn't happen. You know, usually if that happens, then, they're not legitimate. You know, the only way a football agent can get paid is based on their service fee, which is based on the player's salary. Mm-hmm. So anything else, you know, is 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 not allowed. So it should be avoided. And that's the same for paying for trials. You know, mm-hmm. FIFA's new rules on football trial, you know, trialists. You know, you can't. They can't charge for a trial. So therefore, no agent should be charging to arrange a trial. So don't don't spend your money. Don't waste your money. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it completely makes sense. And I think uh, obviously where players sort of fall into a bit of a trap is, you know, you know as well as anyone how many players there are out there that are just so desperate for a chance or for an opportunity. You know, I'm sure you can speak to how many hundreds of thousands of messages that you get you know with with players coming across so you can see how somebody can sort of use that desperation or that demand for something and flip it into uh, a payout for them yeah but as soon as someone says that word i'm looking for an opportunity it's done you know it's 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 everyone's looking for an opportunity even if you're a premier league player you know and you're not getting picked. You're looking for an opportunity. Everybody's looking for an opportunity. It just doesn't work. You know, it, that I just I just really don't like that, that saying. Mm. It's kind of saying, well, I'm waiting for things to happen rather than trying to make them happen myself. Yeah. You know, so you know, I, every, I, no, I need opportunity. You need opportunity. Everyone needs an opportunity in life. But, you know, I just think it's a dangerous game when players use that as a... Um, as a promotional tool. And I always, always wrecked I always correct my players, my clients when they say that, I say, don't go down that road. Yeah. It's a dangerous, you know, it's a dangerous one. It's like, why so, I'm not getting picked. I just need an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's so what's the best way for a player to sort of market themselves, I guess, to potential agents or to clubs? How do they sort of, shed that i guess <laughs> aura of desperation when it comes to i just need an opportunity I, I just need a chance you know how do you sort of um uh, approach it with more of a, a confidence or or more of a, an establishment of i i deserve to be here maybe is the right way that's exactly that that's mm. exactly that you know you've got to take ownership of your career is what i always say to the players so you know, and, and it's the same for agents as well, the, or these uh, licensed agents or scouts or whoever they are uh, and they work in the industry. You know, a transfer mark link and a five-minute video isn't enough. 
you know, it's not enough. You know, Transfermarkt is a is a useful resource, but it's highly inaccurate. Mm. You know, highly inaccurate. And I don't know why players are obsessed by being on it. You know, I, I think, yeah, it shows you're a pro player, but pretty much that's it. All the other information is 50-50 is going to be correct or not. The valuations are nonsense. Um, but there's an obsession that that's enough. That's enough. And a five-minute YouTube video. You know, control the narrative. And this applies to players or agents. You know, control the narrative. It's, it's your career. It's your client's career. Take ownership and you can provide the information that is needed. So it may mean that you have to do a little bit of work. It may mean that you have to actually think about the future rather than what's happening right now. So preparation. So that's is collecting your stats, mm -hmm. you know, collecting your video of past games, you know, maybe even investing in somebody to actually do you a professional highlight video, but also having that full game footage. You know, the amount of players that contact me and they say, oh, here's my transfer mark linked and here's a three minute video. Can mm. you find me a team? It's like, no, <laughs> no, I can't find you a team based on that. You know, it's not, it's not enough unless you are a name because it's so competitive out there. The player pool is huge. Yeah. And every year it's being added to and every year players are leaving. It's brutal. Do you notice, is that hard for players to sort of wrap their mind around like this idea again, that we talk about that they are an asset, that they are a business. Cause I think, you know, I'm wondering if that transition from playing the sport as a youth player, where sure there are players that want to be professional, but there's often a different kind of connotation to the game at the younger levels to now sort of just switching your brain into thinking of everything that you do as kind of a business and how do I increase the value of my business as a player? Or is that sort of more your job in, in order to help them see that? Well, it's like how, you know, even from performances on the pitch, you know, it's, it's about, yeah, it's about winning, it's a, but it is about consistency. It's about performances. Mm -hmm. So it is a team game, but at the same time, you know, players have got to play the game for their benefit. You know, there's only one champion at the end of the year. You know, how many players go out for their career never winning a trophy? Nothing wrong with it. You're pro players. Fantastic. But you've got to play to your strengths. You know, it, it's it's like, you know, healthy disrespect in a way. You've got to look after your career by concentrating on the stats that are going to improve you and help hopefully give you enough to earn a contract at your current club or elsewhere at the same or higher level. Or if it's a drop down that some clubs can interest you because you've done the minutes, you've got the stats. So that is kind of, you know, you treating yourself as an asset mm. and understanding that, you know, when it, when it comes to the very top end with the marketability of players, there's a completely different story than if you're talking to a player in say the USL championship, you know, it's completely different. You know, USL Championship is about minutes on the pitch. You know, if you've got those minutes on the pitch, you've got a good pass completion or you, you, you're um, successful statistically in those key areas, then you're likely to stay in that league. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't, then you'll drop down pretty quickly. You know, I was speaking to a, a club in Nisa the other day and they said they had um, a whole host of trialists they're playing USL championship and they're going to have to release a lot of them and they're not going to get a contract there. Wow. You know, so that's how quickly they drop in two levels probably. You know, so it's, it's tough, but those guys played bit parts in their team's season last year and, and fortunately didn't do enough to stay in there. So, yeah. So it's, it's so competitive, but I don't know. I, the amount, you know, I often look at players' profiles and the information they send me, mm -hmm. and it's just like you could do better than this. You know, you can you can do better. You know, make make the agent's life easier. You know, or if you are going direct to coaches, make their decision process easier. Hmm. And how much of you know? Because I know, f especially as players. 
it is such a roller coaster sort of a career that you're on. There are so many highs and lows and, and even too, when it comes to performance, I think, you know, the way you speak about it there, I, I completely understand, but there's certainly an element of all of us want to perform at our best, you know, day yeah. in and day out. And, and that's not necessarily always the case. And so how much of sort of your job is also, you know, being kind of on that roller coaster with the player. Cause I think, you know, maybe if I speak for other players here for a moment, there are certainly players that say, well, I, you know, sometimes I feel as if my agent is really just kind of after the next paycheck or after the next big contract or next big deal. And, you know, there is a bit of that sort of personal relationship that I think players want with an agent to know that you're in this for more than just what the final payday is going to be. And you're kind of along this journey with me. I mean, I yeah. guess, can you speak to that at all? Like, yeah, yeah what, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So I think the relationship between a player and their agent or a client agent is driven by the player as much as the agent sometimes. So if a player, you know, I have some clients that don't reach out to me unless they need their contract negotiated, but that's what, that's what I do for them. Mm -hmm. And that's all they need from me unless something goes wrong. You know, and if, obviously if they do well, I drop them a quick message, but they don't need any more of that from me. Yeah. You know, others, like I said before, are ringing me two or three times a day updating me and everything, which is, which is fine, but that's a kind of different dynamic, but you know, really an agent should be there when things are not going well, you know, just to offer that support and the guidance. You know, I always say to players, look, it is your career that you can, you make the ultimate decision. I'm not making the decision for you. I can guide you. I can tell you if I think it's a good idea or a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what the positives are or negatives because in everything there are positives and negatives but we can help you come to make the right decision you know that's why i always say so there was one player that you know i was i was working with um a few years ago and he wasn't getting picked and we were talking about a loan i said let's just let's just hang in there for a few more weeks few more weeks and then we'll, we'll then we'll go into it then we'll see what we can do but you know the opinion was he was out he was gonna he was gonna be leaving and i thought that was gonna case but a twist of fate you know player got injured he got in rest of the season you know one of the players of the season not just mm -hmm. in that club but in the entire league and you know his his kind of profile and everything just skyrocketed and that was because of patience, but that was also because partly because we you know we had a proper conversation about it. We didn't make a rash decision because you, you know, most of the time you do have more time than you realize, even if there's a deadline, unless that bell's about to strike, you know, you still have time. So, you know, use that time wisely. Um, and don't make rash decisions. So that, that's kind of what we that's kind of what we go for. And it's often you know often it's hard you know when when things are not going well. That's probably when an agent really needs to to be there for their client, to keep them focused. You know to to talk about different scenarios, look at what they can do to try and improve or try and catch the coach's eye or. You know, if it comes to that point where it's really not happening and some tough decisions got to be made to actually get a strategy in place. Um, and obviously when the good times come, you know, I always, I always used to think, don't, you know, don't get so high on the good times, don't get so low on the bad times, but that's a bit of, a bit of rubbish, I think. I think you've got to enjoy the, the good times, yeah. you know, because they are, they can be fleeting. Maybe not to the extent that Arsenal Football Club did at the weekend, but um, <laughs> um, no, that's, that's a bit of a dig. But um, yeah, but I, no, I think you definitely got to enjoy it. But also understand there are always solutions to things when things go bad. Yeah, I think it's. I think you make a really good point there that so many people's advice is to sort of try and stay in the middle of those highs and lows. 
And uh, I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how effective that can really be. I think part of the reason why so many of us get into football and why we are addicted to it and why we stay in it for so long is because you really do feel all those emotions. And so when yeah. you're at those low points and then you're able to kind of reach that summit again and have this amazing high in your career, I think it would be, I would find it really difficult to advise myself or to advise any other player. Oh yeah. Just make sure you stay level headed when, you know, you just won your team promotion by scoring the game winning goal. Like don't, don't celebrate it too much. It's like, how, how is that? <laughs> I don't know. Now, when you're in the lows, I'm sure that's probably much more difficult to maintain that advice of actually feeling all of the emotions that you're feeling. But um, it, it's fascinating when you talk about it, because it's like I sort of almost imagine the agent and client relationship is so unique in the sense that like a club, you know, a player's relationship with their club, you know, the coaching staff or the front office, they they want what's best out of the 11 players that are on the field that, you know, as we mentioned before, it's a performance driven business. So they want the players that are going to win them games. And, you know, even a little bit too, with the players and other players relationship, that's a pretty competitive relationship that the, they have, you know, especially with positions and who's playing more minutes and, and who's consistently getting picked. And so you kind of, while though it being a team game, there's often a, a little bit of an element of loneliness for a lot of players, I think. So to mm -hmm. have this relationship with an agent where you, you sort of understand that it's like this symbiotic process where both of you want success for the other one. I don't know how, how prevalent that is in the game, you know, when you have these other relationships that everybody kind of wants something different out of you. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It is difficult. <laughs> You know, and it's, and it's, um, I think, you know, that comes with maturity, understanding that mm. because I think when a young player comes into the, into a first team squad, I think it's quite difficult for them sometimes because they're always told by the club it's team, 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 you know, and they will make sacrifices to their game to fit into the team. And then suddenly don't get picked because they're doing what the team and they're not showing enough. And it's like, what is the player meant to do? Yeah. So, you know, in a way, yes, you've got, to, it's about, it's about how a player evolves, how a player adapts, you know, how a player pushes on. So, you know, probably the best example, current example at the moment is um, Connor Bradley at Liverpool, you know, the, mm. the right back. You know, his his kind of first performances, he only started, you know, he really started getting Premier League time in the beginning of January, um, which is due to injuries. He took his chance. But, you know, his initial games were very, very structured, controlled, defend, pass, give. Then he's been building and building and building as his confidence grows. He's bringing his own kind of dynamic, his own character, his personality into the game. Um, which you know when they when they played Newcastle, Liverpool played Newcastle. He was extraordinary. You know he was showboating a little bit, not showboating, but he, he showed his skill. He, he he did things that he would not even dare attempt in his his kind of first couple of games. Mm -hmm. But he's growing into it. He's getting his confidence and he's bringing his own kind of stamp to his performance. So he hasn't been hasn't turned to a robot, which you know a lot of head coaches. Yeah kind of would like yeah but if you need the edge if you want to win you need players to try things you know that's 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 the game and that's you know that's how players develop careers and become memorable is by actually doing something a little bit different and actually delivering on the pitch because yeah. now it, right, the problem is he's put his his expectations are sky high now on his shoulders. Yeah. But that's where you want it to be. If he can stay there, then he's going to have a fantastic career. If he can't, then he's going to drop off, but he's still going to have to be a good pro. Yeah. When it, when it comes to your job and sort of the way in which you work, how much of it, if we again, use this example of maybe Connor Bradley, how much of what you do is trying to sort of find the next up and coming player and how much of it is sort of 
offering the services to an already pre-established player, you know, trying to go out and find somebody who's proven themselves and done it at a high level. And maybe you saying to them, I, Hey, I can offer yeah. you something that other agents can't versus going and scouting the next up and coming player. I see. It's an interesting question about scouts and agents. Mm. Um, see I, my approach and it's simply because I don't have enough time. I don't have time to go and scout a player who's, you know, 16, 17 and hope that they'll make it because you know, the likelihood is they won't mm -hmm. you know, statistically of the players that enter the English football system in the academy from the age of 12 you know, one in 200 actually sign a pro contract of any sort uh, you know, so it's, it's, you know, if you are a betting person it's not the odds are against you. So unless, you know, I've got some great Intel, you know, we, we just um, been working with a, a young player uh, called Reese Braithwaite, who is as a fullback and, and same style as Connell Bradley in a way, but he's um, South African. Um, he's just signed for Cape Town Spurs and he's back to on his you know, first steps in his pro journey. And, you know, he came across us, through scouting um, oh, before COVID. Hmm. So he's 19 now, but we've, we've known about him for, for, a, for a number of years. Um, but that is a rarity. That is a rarity for us. But we you know we tracked his pathway and we've seen him grow and we've done the right research and we developed a relationship with the family. And that's allowed us to, to represent players in South Africa, or even though we're not based in South Africa. Um, but we have high hopes for him, as, as do the club, as, as do everybody. But there's still big question marks if he's going to make it or not. So coming back to that comment about, you know, difference between a scout and an agent. Mm. You know, what is a scout? You know, a scout identifies potential talent for a club. Okay, I think that's a quite, quite a fair assessment. And an agent recruits talent that clubs want. You know, there are so many agents out there that are just glorified scouts. They're just pitching players that clubs, they don't want the players. Yeah. You know, and it's, and it's um, you know, and they're looking to get lucky. And there's no strategy. So from, you know, I, des I, you know, I've done football scouting. I've done opposition analysis in, you know, for many years. Um, and I do have scouting skills, but do I do I utilize that all the time in my agent work? No, because I'm not the one that's making the sit. No one cares what my opinion is on the player. You know, no, nobody cares what the parents' opinion is. Player whose opinion matters the most? It's the club. Mm. So you can provide information, but you can't really in this world of stats and analytics. You, know, you can't really influence. A club's decision anymore you can't be like a used car salesman anymore selling mm -hmm. players you know, a lot, lot, lot more science to that yeah i wonder if you can speak to this a little bit more because i'm not sure if players understand sort of the relationship that agents have with clubs because i think players understand the relationship that it's supposed to be with between client and agent between player and agent what sort of your relationship with the clubs, I think, is is so paramount because it, it allows you know, to facilitate sort of all these deals with players. And, you know, I think a lot of clubs probably very much value and trust the opinion that you give when it comes to, I think, that you should bring this player on board or or this player should be a part of your club. And And who knows, maybe that's something that you just spoke about there where maybe they don't care, but then talk to me what is the what's the relationship then with a club like how do you two partner together oh, that's a good that's a good question well some 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 agents it depends on on the approach of the agent so some will purely build relationships with a few clubs and they will just basically work for those clubs and try and get deals done for those clubs mm -hmm. great great business model you know if if you can find the players and the other agents, which, you know, kind of I'm leaning more towards would be, you know, I represent the player. So my expectation on the player is that they are good enough to find a club. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So every time I have to promote that club player to a club, in a way, in my mind, that player's value is going down. Mm. Okay, or I haven't recruited properly. So, you know, I no, I, we do have great connections with clubs. You know that we do recommend players, and they do you know provide their insights. But from my perspective, do I want to be best friends with clubs? You know, and, I, and the answer is no, because I'm looking after the interest of the player. Hmm. You know, because I will basically try my best to get the best deal for the player. So I try not to leave money on the table. And mm. I will see how far I can push things in terms of getting the right terms in the contract. And, you know, some clubs get frustrated by it because I'm not making it simple for them. But if I represent the player, why should I make it simple for them? You know, and, and by and large, you know, clubs respect that. And they know that you're not going to get pushed over if a problem arises. So it's it's a little bit, it's a difficult question, question to ask because, you know, if you are recommending a player to a club, then you are providing a service to the club. So mm -hmm. this is where the whole dual representation comes. You know, the fact that you're facilitating a, a meeting with the player means that you're providing a service not just to the client, but also to the club. Yeah. So it's, you know, that's where the dual representation. So I think, you know, in terms of how I operate, it's about being efficient. It's about being professional and it's about actually doing what you, what you said you're going to do. Um, yeah. Like I said before, I don't, I don't really want to be best friends with clubs. You know, if, if, if that develops, then great, but I'm not going to negotiate my fee before I've negotiated the player's fee. That makes yeah. sense. No, it, it does. Cause it, it really just sparked in my head here. If you, yeah, if you do have such a strong relationship with a club, then it sort of begs the question of sort of whose side are you really on? Right? Where, where's the loyalty sort of in this relationship? And it's, I've been reading a little bit about finance recently. And, and so it's like, a lot of times this is prevalent when it comes to, you know, wealth managers or people that handle your money, right? It's sort of like asking the question of where is your, it's called your fiduciary responsibility or where, yeah. you know, where is your fiduciary? Who are you sort of beholden to? Are you trying to make money for Vanguard? Or are you trying to make money for your client, right? Or, you know, pick any yeah. major wealth company. So it is fascinating. And maybe it even ties back to what we spoke about earlier in the conversation of sort of the commission structure and the split and then who is sort of footing the bill, I guess, in the simplest terms. But yeah, you do have to imagine if you have such a good relationship with the club, maybe a player looks at that and says, well, are you trying to do a club friendly deal? Or are you trying to do, you know, a me friendly deal? And I think that is definitely an interesting route that I hadn't necessarily thought of because I thought of agents as sort of wanting to have these deep relationships with clubs because there would be that trust level there. But I, I definitely understand that. Yeah, I think I, you know, I think you could be manipulated if you if if you just try and be too friendly with a club. You know, the truth is, you know, if if a if a a club wants your player and you, and the player is strong with the agent and it's mm -hmm. all contracted properly, then they have to talk to you. You know, so it, it's it, it puts you in a in a position where you know you, you of, of some some kind of power in a way you know so you if you ha if the club has to speak to you you know do you really need to have a fantastic amazing relationship with the club no no um it's like you know how many if you were to represent mbappe hmm. today you know how many club contacts would you need <laughs> yeah zero you don't need one just need mbappe you know, and that's that's the reality of it. And they'll have to talk to you. If you represented him, they would and you had the license, they would have to talk to you and you would be the one negotiating the deal. And they would probably be lauding you and doing everything to to keep you happy um until the deal's done and then suddenly they don't want to speak to you again until there's contract negotiation time. Yeah. You know? And, and that's just the that's just the way it is. That's the business. Yeah. So unless it's a local team and you're down there all the time and, but still there's a little bit of, um, mm, don't want to give them too much information. There's still that kind of angle. Yeah. 
Yeah, if we use this, because a lot of what we've been speaking about here today is kind of the sort of the in between times for players, and when we speak about free agency, right? And you know, I just yeah. mentioned Mbappe there. If we sort of paint the picture of what it's like to really be a free agent, all the way from the Mbappe's down to the player who has just been relegated and is out of a contract, and you know, they're only their second year as a pro, and now they're trying yeah. to figure out what is it that I do next. I mean, what is that process like for you? And what is that process like for players, sort of that free agency time? Yeah, well, look at Mbappe to begin with, or, or just any kind of top player that's kind of managed their contracts so that they become a free agent at the optimum time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, often player power is mentioned. And you know, the reality is, Yes, there is player power, but player power only exists a few times in a career. Mm. So at the moment, Mbappe has power because he has four months, five months left of his contract with PSG. He can walk away wherever he wants. You know, he can go to any team in the world if he wanted to go. Um, but the problem with that, Mbappe is, even though he has all that power, how many clubs can actually sign him? I think maybe there is only one that can sign him. And that's where he's at at the moment. You know, I, I, Real Madrid's been yeah, muted for ages, but with these financial fair play rules, it'd be interesting to see how they managed to get a deal of that kind of nature done. You know, in the past, we'd have Barcelona, but they are broke. <laughs> yeah. You know, Chelsea are just, don't know what's going on there. You know, Man City... Possibly, but obviously they've got those uh, 100 um, um, profit and sustainability financial fair play things in the Premier League over their head. So that kind of takes them out. Liverpool's been mentioned only because his mother is a big fan of Liverpool, but then Jurgen Klopp's leaving. So is that the best move? And can Liverpool Finance is doing it? Bayern Munich. Can't see that happening, money they've mm-hmm. been spending. So there's probably still PSG or Saudi Arabia, you know, and that is yeah. it. Even with a player that has so much power, he actually has very little at the moment. So it's, you know, in past years, when a player like Mbappe become a free agent, say if he was a free agent three or four years ago, yeah, he'd have a lot more power just because of the way the um, football markets were and they were just throwing cash around left, right and centre. So it's really interesting to see what's going to happen with him. I probably think he's going to end up, well, is it going to be Real Madrid or PSG? But I probably would lean to him signing a new contract, PSG. Yeah. Even if it's a shorter one, even if it's like a two-year deal. Is that, it, it was fascinating just watch you kind of go through that process of the different teams, right? Is, is that sort yeah. of the process that you work with in your head kind of for every player that you have, right? Like, okay, yeah. could send him to this club, but uh, that coach has just been sacked and that's kind of a bit of instability there. Or this club, there's been sort of financial issues in the past, so maybe not there. This club could be a great one for him, but we have to see if how that compares to, you know, this club, it might be just as appealing to him. Maybe one's different contract, yeah. one's better contract, one's better team, right? Like, is that sort of the Rolodex that you're just flipping over in your head for each and every player when it comes to that free agency time? Yeah, yeah, it's like I could talk about this for a whole another session, player pathways. <laughs> um, but yeah, but every player has a different pathway at different stages of their career. And it's very rare for a player to jump up several levels. Mm-hmm. Okay, usually if a player performs, they go up to the next level. They perform again, they go up to the next level, or they stay where they are, or they drop down. And that's that's the way it is. It's very rare for a player to be a level four team, then go straight to a level one. It does happen, usually for young players, but that's the exception to the rule. So, you know, that's and that's driven by performances. Um, Often when you're looking at which, you know, which club is next for a player, you know, you've got to consider playing style, level of the league, you know, how big of a step up is it in terms of quality, but also in terms of salary? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, salary is a guide 
of terms of level. Okay, so just like I said, you know, player's not going to jump league levels. You know, he's not going to jump from being a 20,000 a year player to suddenly earning 100 in the US, unless he's exceptional and exceptional performances. It's just it's unlikely to happen. So it's about understanding where that player is in the scheme of things, where he is in that pyramid, where he is in that pathway. And so, yeah, you are going through those kind of things, you know, oh, is, you know, all the time. And then that's why when you're promoting a player, you know, you need to understand the player and what quality he's bringing. Um, because, you know, I was speaking to somebody the other, uh, yesterday, I think it was, and he said, oh, this guy was a left-footed, six-foot-two, fast as you like. Exceptional player, really good. But the head coach didn't want him because he didn't do this and didn't do that. Mm-hmm. wasn't his style of player good enough to play that level but not on that team so really the agent should have realised that before promoting him and actually understood look you're not going to get in there you know it's just not going to be it's not going to be a good good fit for you so yeah it's a, it's a little bit of realism there um, but also sometimes Things come from a left field. You don't know where, why they're, you know, especially in the CPL. I'm seeing some of the signings at the moment. I'm like, wow, <laughs> baffled. Yeah. On yeah. why, you know, they're choosing certain players. So although, you know, you try and create this kind of rule in your head, it depends on what the, completely depends what the club's thinking. They make be thinking completely something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, as you were talking there, it was making me think that it's like, you can probably sit down with a player early in their career when you start working with them and, and maybe think, Oh, here's how we can sort of map out your pathway. But I mean, any of us can speak to that seems to be something that's going to change from year to year based on your performance, based on club. I mean, based on a million different factors that we can yeah. list. Um, exactly. And, and you mentioned too, as, as well, the salary, uh, and it's something kind of we've talked about today. And I'm happy that you've used kind of that twenty thousand term as well, because I think there's a lot of people out there that really just have misconceptions about how much money is in football. And, I, and I'm sure mm-hmm. you'd be an amazing person to help us shed some light on this. You know, like I even I always go back to I know it was now close to a decade ago, but there was kind of the global football report that came out that really dove into more in depth of what player salaries are. And I think it's like, you know, 2% of global professional footballers earn, I think it's more than 700,000. Right. And I I think even have it here and and it's like 45% of the, you know, 16,000 players that were surveyed make less than a thousand a month, you know, and the predominantly most players are earning between a thousand and $2,000 a month. And so, you know, yes, you see the contract where, Neymar gets paid a half a million dollars every time he posts on his Instagram about Saudi Arabia, but that is so far the anomaly versus, you know, a lot of times what it's going to look like is a player is getting a couple hundred bucks or a thousand bucks a month and they're being put up in a house with a bunch of other players and, you know, and everywhere in between. So I'm just, I I guess I'll, I'll leave the kind of door open from here. If there's anything that you'd like to share in terms of kind of what it really looks like as salaries from professional footballers. Well, it's the reality, isn't it? You know, I was keep on talking about, you know, there there are exceptions to the rule and there are players that are you know, the one percent that are earning the huge wages. Yeah. Massive wages. But the majority are not. You know, the majority are just try, trying to keep in the game. You know, as long as they get their accommodation the amount of players that I I say to you, you know, what are you looking for in terms of money? And they will mm. say to me so this is the question I used to always ask, you know, what are you looking for? Yep. And they used to say, oh, 60, 80, 100,000. And I go, all right, okay. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> so I changed the question now. I say, oh, no, so what, what was your last contract? And that's a much better guide. And some players are really hesitant to give it to me. Because it's in no, it's right. They say, oh, well, I was only earning like $1,000 and they're paying for accommodation and a bit of food and travel. So it's great. You're a pro though. You, yeah. you are a pro and you, you, you've you still got a chance to go up that level. So just because they told me that figure doesn't mean I'm going to go and negotiate a contract for that 
thousand dollars you know hopefully we can double their money or triple their money you know that's where we're looking at it from that perspective so at the lower end that's really it's really tough really tough but you know players and their family always believe just because they're a pro player they must be earning an absolute fortune yeah you know but it's not it's not the case and it's same you know with agents everyone thinks agents are earning a fortune in commissions because you see all these reports at the top end of all these agents earning these multi-million pound deals and yes they're out there but by and large you know agents are struggling just like the players are you know to and and commission just helps them keep their business going so those are the those are the realities yeah because you look at you know, th those numbers that we're just speaking about there. And then if we're speaking about agents are taking percentages off of that, you know, if you've already sized up that salary and said, well, that's not a very big salary. And then an agent's only taking a percentage off that. then you yeah. certainly see how, you know, like you mentioned very early on in the show that you can see how an agent says, all right, well, maybe the way in which for me to go about my business is sort of quantity of players. How many players can I represent? Right. You know, if, I, if I'm doing deals for all these players and I'm only getting such a small commission, maybe I need to have 50 players on my roster or something like mm -hmm. that. And, and yeah, so the, other, the other way to look at it is, you know, you, you don't offer your services to those lower level players, mm. you know, which you only say, right, I'm only going to take a player that's earning over 50 or 100,000, yeah. you know, which, you, which a lot of agencies, which a lot of agencies do, you know, they, they, that's, that's their limit. So at least they know players getting 50,000, they're going to get two and a half grand, two and a half thousand dollars, pounds, euros um, as a minimum. You know, they may get five, but they're willing to work for that two and a half. You know, it's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, but even if you're in a hundred thousand, probably an agent's going to pick, you know, going to collect between five and 10,000. 10, you know, half of that will come from the player or all of it may come from the club. So the, mm. the player, the maximum he would ever pay is 5%. And is that is that sort of maybe the evolution of, of your career as an agent, or is that just what many agents do? You know, because I imagine- in the the, There's the new kind of FIFA rules in terms of, of service fees. Yeah, but so in, terms of sort of, in terms of sort of the players that you're choosing to represent, because I imagine, like you say, in the beginning, it's very competitive and, and may, you know, you can't walk in on day one as an agent and say, oh, I'm only going to work with players who are making X amount. It's like, well, you haven't worked with a yeah. single player yet. So how are you to how are you to go in and say that? So yeah, I imagine it has to evolve and change as you go. Yeah. yeah, I think I think, you know, I think it's an interesting question. So. It depends on how you pitch yourself. Hmm. So, you know, when I started off, you know, I I, I was able to sign a, a guy that was on the brink of a Premier League um, first team squad. You know, and there was loads of other agents that he could have chose. But it's because I prepared myself and I came with a narrative and a promise and and... Yeah, it was, it was just, you know, it just kind of just worked out. But I, 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 so I always say, don't say you're a new agent when you're starting out. You know, that's the mm -hmm. worst thing you do to a client or a club. You know, prove your knowledge, show your enthusiasm. Um, but in terms of like my business model, you know, if, if somebody wants me to negotiate a contract for them and, you know, it's a small contract, I'll, I'll do it. But it's just like all the other work which you know is is you know is it fair for that player to sign that player because i can't commit the time that they need in order to find the club and they're going to have to do a lot of the work themselves because you no know, it just doesn't work yeah in terms of a lifestyle and also in terms of business a business model so that's where you know those players that are looking for that opportunity they need to put the work in themselves you know they need to hustle they can i can I, an agent should give them guidance but they're gonna have to understand they're gonna have to do some of the hard yards as well where where do you see i guess the future of you know we've spoken about a lot of things that have sort of changed and, and even some sort of new rules that may be implemented when it comes to 
maybe clubs versus players in terms of service fees. Also, I know the FIFA agent exam has sort of been, I think before it wasn't mandated by all agents to have, and now it's become a requirement for all agents have to have that. And, and just e- even, I guess, the landscape of football in general, like, is there anything that you see that's really evolved recently in terms of football or, or where you may see things going and evolving in the coming years? Let's talk about the, the kind of football market at the moment. I think it's an exciting time. I think there are so many new teams being created, so many new leagues around the world being created, so many new opportunities for players to to have a career as a professional player. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's exciting times. So I think you know migration of football talent around the world is just going to increase. I think um, players of kind of different levels are going to have the opportunity to play overseas more. You know, in the past, it was only if you want to come to Europe, and this probably will stay the case, but if you want to come to Europe and you're outside of Europe, um, you're going to have to be one of the best players in the league and earn your way to go. Unless you're lucky enough to have a passport and be dual national. Mm-hmm. I think otherwise, it's be very difficult for players to, 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 to go to the top leagues unless they are top top player or a top performing club or league but i think you know elsewhere you know australia is a huge market at the moment for taking in players you know i'm i'm hearing there's there's so many different opportunities coming out so it's an exciting time to be a professional player and to have a great lifestyle Hmm. and great great kind of cultural experiences so um that's one plus side in terms of football agency um it's going to be interesting to see what how things develop over the next kind of three or four transfer windows, especially this summer transfer window, because the rules have been introduced, but they've been challenged, so they haven't correctly been implemented. There are still a lot of people out there who are unlicensed that are pretending to be agents, Mm. again involved in the business and causing the same problems the rules are designed to get rid of so i think eventually once everything has been cleared and the rules are fully implemented you know fifa will get tough on this because you know they've really kind of made a statement by having everybody to be licensed and pass an exam to opening up to everybody in 2015 to going back to a licensing system. You know, it's a huge change. You know, I, yeah. I know they wish they never did it in the first place because it was kind of working well. But now you have loads of people in the industry that shouldn't be in the industry, mm-hmm. but they're not accepting it because why should they? Because the rules aren't strong enough at the moment. But as soon yeah. as that goes, I can see, you know, I think the number of kind of agents in the industry or those proposing to be agents in the industry will drop by about 50 or 60 percent wow so significantly drop um which means you know from my perspective less competition but hopefully it will mean less agents but more qualified agents and and more professional kind of industry Mm. and players getting better advice you know that's that's what that's what I kind of hope for. So I'm all for the regulations, maybe not complete the service cap fees. Um, but generally, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good step, but at the same time, I can understand those that weren't, there were intermediaries and set up their businesses must be very frustrated because the exam is tough. The exam is tough. And just because you pass an exam doesn't mean that you know the business. Hmm. You know, I've had loads of agents contact me going, so what do I do now? You know, have you got a copy of representation contract that I can sign my client? I'm like, oh, mate, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's but that's the that's the way it is. Just because you pass the exam doesn't mean you know the job. Yeah. You know, that's that's the thing. So um some intermediaries are really good and they just can't pass the exam because it's it's really tough. And, and that's also a business that you've started or a passion that you have as well, is sort of educating agents and and I guess what brought you to that line of work as well and and what's been some of the exciting and rewarding parts of the education side of agents oh, thank you for asking yeah well you know it, it it kind of you know when i was looking to be an agent you know I, I passed my exam but also i knew that i didn't have enough kind of knowledge 
So, you know, I've read in books, but also did a um, um, sports manager worldwide. I did a uh, sports agent course and then, you know, got on, got on with Dr. Lashbrook really well and Liz and, you know, we created the FIFA football agent course, basically. And then just trained, you know, trained people to be agents. And, you know, it's amazing, even from that very first course, I'm still in contact with people who were on it and they're still working in the industry, which is, you know, wow. some are working as sport directors, some are scouts, some are just, you know, still doing a little bit on the side as an agent. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been fantastic. You know, one of some of the, some of the guys that have, have been involved in some huge deals. You know, one of the guys I uh, worked with you know, was one of the eight agents in the Neymar deal. <laughs> you know, wow. eight agents in the Neymar deal. <laughs> he was there. He was there. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's a journey. You know, it's an opportunity. It's um, you never know where it can take you, and people have different approaches to the industry and it's really intriguing to see how people go about it. But most of the people that I know have, have, have really tried to do it with integrity, have the best intentions for clients. And actually their kind of understanding is if, you know, if they do a good job, money will come their way mm. rather than money being the, the first focus. And then the players kind of, needs or their requirements second so yeah but i do find it i do find it very rewarding especially when somebody passes the exam because i know how much effort goes into it and and how delighted they are yeah it's it's, it's good it's good yeah yeah well uh, it's been amazing learning so much about the industry and, and, and football with you today john I, I really appreciate your time um and yeah someone who is been involved in the game for a long time, but not able to see kind of some of the things that you've been able to experience is it's definitely unique for me. And I'm sure a lot of the audience will really enjoy this as well. So I appreciate your insight and your knowledge and especially what you're doing, like we just spoke about there at the end to sort of educate so many other Asians out there and sort of, you know, raise the standard of, of all like kind of the football business is, is pretty unique. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that's what I want to do. And it's, it's you no, know, it's educating agents, but it's also it's educating players as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, because I think you know agents are going to play play an increasing important role in the industry. You know, at kind of all levels, and it's tough for a player to do it all on his or her own. Mm. You know, to make those right decisions. So, you know, I, I would always recommend that you know, they try and get the advice of an agent. Um, and not just rely on family, friends, or or even, you know, or even the advice of the club, you know, because sometimes that can be a little bit miscued to their to their benefit. Yeah. So, is there um, is there any story that sort of comes to mind when you think of maybe a player who tried to act in their own behalf, or maybe a dad who thought they could negotiate <laughs> a oh, huge raise hundreds. or something? There's hundreds. You know, there's hundreds. You know, there's, there's I guess, you know, it's, 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 it's not really a story, but it's, you know, it's just like people make bad decisions. They make bad decisions, which they don't understand. They're going to be big decisions early on in their career. So, you know, one of a common thing that happens is, you know, when you speak to a player who's under 23, um, who's looking to move internationally, you know, hasn't quite worked out for them. And then you discover that they've left an academy on their own accord but mm. haven't negotiated their release properly and they have to pay training compensation. Oof. It's done. You know, it's, it, it's so hard for an agent to even do anything. And there are so many situations like that, that come up and it's like, you should have managed this process, you know, better, but you know, the family are talking it from an emotional perspective rather than a business perspective. Yeah. And as soon as you do that, you're done. And it's like, you know, just players that decide to cancel contracts when they've got nothing else. It's like, don't do it. Unless it's really terrible, stay in the game. You're better to be employed than unemployed. You're better to be mm -hmm. training in a team than training in the park on your own. Yeah. Because you know? you, you, you're you a long time, you could be a long time a free agent. You could be an even longer time out of the game. So it's it's really, really tough. Um, but you know, it's like, um, a sky Andrew, one of my kind of 
close friends um who's a, who's a who's an agent you know he always says like the it is the dream factory you know you can go from here to there it can be it can be a crazy journey and any player in a way can reach reach heights that they didn't even believe was possible so um yeah so it's it's a it's a great career it's a great business to be involved in yeah i'm i'm sure um yeah, man, like I said, I, I can't thank you enough. This has been amazing. I've learned so much. Like I said, I'm, I'm sure people are going to learn a lot as well. So I, I really appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Speak to you again soon. All right. That is it for this week. Thank you so much to John. I uh, really appreciate that. Learned so much about what agents do and their wor- their role in this crazy world that is football. So I can't thank him enough for stepping in and sharing some of his insight over the past 15 plus years of working in, in high level elite football. I hope all you guys enjoyed that. And I hope you gained a lot of insight into, you know, maybe your own journey as a player, or if you're interested in becoming an agent, something like that, hopefully you're able to gain something from this episode. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. Thank you so much. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.